today we're going to cover and build upon what we started on at the end of Tuesday's lecture and that is conservation of music <laughs> and momentum. So conservation of energy and momentum. And so when we see uh, energy, we think of kinetic. And right now we're going to keep everything linear. We've got kinetic. We've got, um, and you can use E or KE. We've got potential energy. which is for gravity. We've got uh, potential energy, uh, one half kx squared, spring potential energy. And we have our usual suspects of like work, force times distance, and if we're going to do this through um, energy <coughs> released via friction force, then that work is friction force times the distance and whatever that ends up becoming. Momentum. which is P, the P comes from the Latin word impetus or impulse. So the P is in there and that's mass times velocity. Now for momentum, the units are simply kilograms, meters per second. There's, uh, there's no cute shorter term for it. But for energy, it is a Newton meter or a kilogram meter squared, second squared, or simply a joule. Is a what? Work. That's a W. Yes. Capital. The only thing that kind of looks like a lowercase W would be my omega. The, the lowercase omega. Is that a B besides the spring or B? This? All right, it's tear up Dr. Eschenberg's handwriting today. Fine, I'll just dig in the pile and start pulling out some of yours. And then we'll see who's better. <laughs> um, all right, the, um, so now with the conservation of energy and momentum, we have to think about collisions in elastic and elastic. For these collisions, the inelastic, it's P only. Only momentum is conserved in elastic potential and energy are conserved. And when it comes to the types of collisions that we'll be dealing with on a uh, in 213, inelastic is pretty much over 99% of everything we're going to have to worry about and elastic is less than 1%. Elastic is less than 1% because when you have to conserve momentum and energy at the same time, it collisions like that do not occur on a normal basis. Inelastic happens all the time. In the terms of an inelastic, 
collision. If you took the energy final and divided it by the energy initial, that would always be less than one or less than 100%. So if there was a conservation of energy, that ratio would then be one. So in the case of the inelastic collision, the energy released, the three most common sources are heat, sound, um, deformation, of objects. So the energy, where does the energy go? Well, it's if two things collide and they stick together, there's a little bit of friction. That friction produces heat. That energy had to come from someplace. It came from originally the kinetic energy of the objects. Um, energy was released through sound. It, sound requires energy to generate. Um, deformation of the objects. If the object changes shape, a certain force is required over a certain distance, which is an energy, to change the shape of those objects. So inelastic collisions, technically in the grand scheme of things, yes, energy is conserved in terms of the universe. The energy of the universe before didn't uh, increase or decrease during an inelastic collision. But when it comes to the mechanical energy, the local energy of that system, energy is not conserved. Um, as an example, You have a, a mass of cookie dough. That mass is five kilograms, and it is traveling with a velocity of positive 10 meters per second. It hits another mass of cookie dough. <coughs> mass two is 20 kilograms, and its velocity is zero meters per second. Now the one thing when you do the uh, when you're dealing with magnitudes only that's fine but when you are working with momentum direction is very important. And just as you have, well, acceleration in a two ballistic or in a ballistic uh, problem, up is positive, down is negative. In this particular direction, left is negative and right is positive. So V1 is positive 10 meters per second. If it was going to the left, then it would have a speed, and it had a speed of 10 meters per second, its velocity would then be negative. So you need to pay attention to the positive and the negative signs. Now let's just, what we're gonna do is we're gonna, since this is an inelastic collision, they stick. What is their final velocity. Now obviously if you have an object coming in from the left and heading right and smacking into an object, that object should continue moving to the right in some, in some fashion. It should decrease its speed, so the number that we should get should be less than 10. If you end up with a number greater than 10, then we got issues. So the momentum before, let's just say initial, is equal to the momentum after. 
Now the momentum initial is the sum of the two momenta before. And one of the things that we could do right away is we could set V2 is equal to zero. Why? Because it's initially at rest. Yes? I would typically, I would either tell you or if the word that gave it away was stick. If you see the word stick, that's inelastic. Also the case uh, from a practical point of view, one, an elastic collision will not be on the test. It will be in the problem or in the multiple choice, but it will not be a specific problem. The other thing is, it won't be in the problem sets. Elastic collisions will only be in multiple choice questions, and that's it. Just knowing that it's conser what's conserved and what's not conserved. Now, since they're combined, Those masses are simply added together. It is one mass now with a combined mass of M1 plus M2. Now I'm looking for VF. So M1, V1, So 50 divided by 25 or 2 meters per second. And so that's the final velocity of the system. So let's say for a moment if energy was conserved the energy initial should equal the energy final. Let's disprove that. The energy initial is one half M1 V1 squared. It's the only object that's moving. There's no change in potential energy. So the only thing we have is kinetic. This gives you one half M1 five uh, V1 10 squared, which is 250 joules. So the initial energy of the system is 250 joules. If energy is conserved, the energy should remain 250. Energy final. Well, the only object moving is the combined mass M1 plus M2. And they're both moving at the final velocity V sub F. This means one half five plus uh, 20 times two squared. So two times 25 or 50 joules. So the energy final is less than the energy initial. Energy was lost during this act. 250 minus 50 energy initial minus energy final is 200 joules lost. Where did it go? Well, the cookie dough was had to change shape. Uh, sound was released. Heat was released. Stuff like that. Now, the um, fraction <coughs> remaining is just E final divided by E initial <coughs> 50 divided by, whoops, not 500, 50. 50 divided by 250 is 0 0.2 or 20%. The fraction lost is 
1 minus fraction remaining 1 minus e final over e initial or 1 minus 0 0.2 or 0 0.8 or 80 percent. So that's how you calculate energy loss and energy remaining. And so that is uh, a simple example of inelastic collisions do not conserve energy. If they did, we would have gotten energy lost as zero. But no, there was a significant loss in energy. Now, not only can um, conservation of momentum work in terms of a collision, you can kind of think of it as uh, conservation of energy or conservation of momentum can be in, and I'm going to use this term very lightly, an anti-collision. And one of the things that, um, like, where, what's an anti-collision? Because I know that that's kind of weird, but when I say it, you're gonna go, oh, it's kind of, makes sense. Say you're on the ice, and you have a, um, a gun that fires, let's just say, um, 100 gram bullets, which are really big. Um, so, the mass of this individual is 50 kilograms. That's a big dude. But the bullet that he fires, the mass of the bullet is 0 0.1 kilograms. The velocity of the person is zero meters per second and then the mass of the bullet initial, or the velocity of the bullet initially is zero meters per second. So initially, everything is at rest. So initially, everything is at rest. Wonderful. That means so kinetic energy is zero. If nothing is moving, if the person is just sitting there with the, with the gun and then the bullet, then there's no energy. There's no kinetic energy. But then he fires the bullet. The velocity of the bullet when he fired it is, let's just say 300 meters per second. So if he fires that bullet to the left, and he's standing on ice, or some type of frictionless surface, where's the individual going to go? Or is he gonna stay there? No, he's gonna move backwards. Like recoil, that's the term that you all know. If you fire a gun, there's pushback. That's conservation of momentum. If you threw, uh, if you were on a frictionless surface, or if, let's just say you were on roller skates, what's the best way to do to move in one direction? You throw something in the opposite direction. And conservation of momentum says that you got to go in the other direction. So what is the velocity of the person after they fire the gun. 
So the momentum before is equal to the momentum after. It has to be conservation of momentum. The mo initial momentum, because everything is zero in terms of its velocity, is zero. The final momentum, mass of the bullet, velocity of the bullet, mass of the person, velocity of the person, is equal to zero. So minus the mass of the person, velocity of the person, equals mass of the bullet, velocity of the bullet, or velocity of the person is mass of the bullet, velocity of the bullet, mass of the person, and the negative sign. Now, the mass of the bullet, 0 0.1. The velocity of the bullet, negative 300. Now, why is it negative 300? Because it was fired to the left in a negative direction. So its velocity, we didn't use the word speed. We used the word velocity. So if it's fired to the left, then it's fired to the left with a velocity of negative 300 meters per second. So in a way, I should say speed of the bullet is 300 meters per second left. And then the mass of the person is 50. So this gives you positive 0 0.6 meters per second. 300 divided by 50 is 6. 6 times 0.1 is 0.6. So the meter so he's going to have a recoil velocity of 0 0.6 meters per second. Now the initial energy since nothing was moving was 0. The final energy is 1 half mass of the bullet velocity of the bullet squared plus 1 half mass of the person velocity of the person squared. So that's 1 half 0 0.1 300 squared plus 1 half 50 0 0.6 squared. And that becomes Forty five hundred and nine joules. So initially there was no energy, no kinetic energy, and now there's over four thousand joules of energy. Just as a side note, where did the energy come from? The gun, the gunpowder. What happened was is that the chemical potential energy of that powder within the cartridge behind the bullet was released. And so it went into pushing a bullet up to 300 meters per second. So it, now we're starting to talk about things like chemical potential energy, changing materials from a solid into a gas, from uh, creating fire, expansion, all that stuff which relates to chemistry and then all sorts of other things. So there's another example of energy is not being conserved. Energy is being pulled in from another resource and put into motion. One of the things that I've noticed in, um, in lab is that there seems to be a, people get all confused between lab and class and stuff. And so one of the best things in this particular conservation of energy and momentum is that there will be a conservation of energy and momentum lab. In this lab, you're gonna be doing two things. Well, one major thing is you have a ball compressed on a spring 
and then that ball hits like a, this is like a little bucket. And then what happens is the, uh, the bucket is collided with the ball so it moves and then the ball reaches a particular angle. So here it's all spring potential energy. Here it's all kinetic energy. Now going from here to here, <coughs> there's no collision, hasn't collided with anything. The spring came off the ball. So here the energy at one is equal to the energy at two. Now over here, the ball is caught. So we have an inelastic collision. So in this particular case, the momentum at two is equal to the momentum at three. This is where the collision happens. So it sticks, the ball fits into the bucket and the piece of equipment that you're gonna use, a lot of people were going, what's this, what's this? And it's the, uh, when you were doing the 2D ballistics uh, experiment, the machine that you use then, we're gonna attach an arm to it, and that will become this part, and you're gonna use that again. When moving to stage four, the bucket and the ball rise to a particular height. And the arm makes a particular angle. Now in this particular case, there is no collision. So once again, you can figure out that the energy at three is equal to the energy at four. So there's one part where you do conservation of momentum and then other parts where you do conservation of energy. Now in the, um, in the experiment, <coughs> And we'll do the experiment effectively. In the experiment, we find the initial velocity of the ball. So we're looking for the velocity of the ball just prior to it impacting with the bucket. Um, we're not really going to use like the spring and all that potential energy, but it's it could be part of the problem. And in the problem set, I mean, spring potential energy is used. So what data do we have in this particular experiment? Well, what you do have let's say that that particular theta is equal to 30 degrees and that the length of the arm is 0 0.3 meters. So what you did is you fired the ball, the ball was caught, the mechanical arm raised to a particular height 
and it rays to a particular angle. And the only thing I'm gonna give you is the angle and the arm length. And so from that information, oh, and then we also need, we need two other bits. The mass of the ball is uh, 50 grams and the mass of the arm is 0 0.2 kilograms. So we have a ball, we have an arm. Uh, what they typically do is you measure the mass of the ball in the arm. And you get those, and you got this. So the question is, how do we get velocity? Well, in this particular problem, you work backwards. You go from four to three. So when going from four to three, what you're doing is you're going from this position to this position, which is post collision. In this experiment, you're given that theta and that H. So if the bucket was down in its full position, then it would be like that. Now when this thing, and actually now that we've got the time to really just explore what's going on, Here, that velocity final is zero. There's no motion. Down here, there is a velocity, and um, we'll call that V sub I. The initial velocity of going from three to four, or in this case, from four to three. If you took something that was at rest and dropped it down, the speed at the bottom would be the same as it heading up. So that angle theta is given. Now one of the things that you'll notice is that when it swings upwards, it's upward and there's a change in height. Let's call that H. Now this particular length is the length of the arm as well as this but I'm gonna label this as L, the length of the arm. So if I know this is the length of the arm because it's the same arm that swung down, and I know that this is the change in height, H, what's this length? Tick, tock, tick, tock. What is it? Cosine of theta? Mm, need more information. Give me it as a um, as a difference. It's L minus H. If that's length H and the total length is L, then that has to be L minus H. And what we're going to do is we're going to derive what H is as a function of L and theta. And this is where a lot of the trig comes in. So cosine of theta is the adjacent side L minus H divided by the hypotenuse, which is H. So H cosine theta is L minus H or H cosine theta plus H is equal to L, or H cosine plus one is equal to L. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah, blah, 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 blah. Is 
Say what? Why are there two L's? You mean, why is that L and that L is in there? That length is L as well. If I have my arm and I know this length and it swings down like that, that length is still the same. So it has to be length L. All right, now let's do this right. Uh, cosine theta is adjacent L minus H over hypotenuse, which is L. So L cosine theta is L minus H. H is L minus L cosine theta. So H is L one minus cosine theta. And so that's, that's how you would get H. <coughs> now, now that we have H, I know that the energy at three is the same as the energy at four. The energy at four is entirely what? Kinetic or potential? So four is up here, three is down there. It's entirely what? Potential, correct. So potential energy at four is just MGH, or more importantly, mass of the ball plus mass of the arm, GH. Now, what is the energy at three? Is it kinetic, potential, kinetic or potential or a combination of both? Tick tock, tick tock. Say it. It's gotta be one of the three, say it with conviction. The answer is truly fusion. Said it with conviction. So it's got to be one of three. Energy at three, is it potential? It's at the bottom of the curve. It can't be potential. And if there's no potential, it can't be a combination of kinetic and potential. So what's the third choice? <laughs> kinetic. Exactly. Good. So this is one half mv squared. So one half m b plus m a v squared now one of the things that crops up frequently is that the plug and chuggers go well why didn't you just plug in numbers and because i gotta have my numbers i appeal to your sense of laziness or as i would like to say efficiency why plug in numbers if they just cancel you don't need the numbers V squared over two is equal to GH, or V is equal to two GH, well, V squared is two GH, or V is the square root of two GH, and then V is equal to the square root of two GL, one minus cosine theta. And so if I wanted simply the velocity of this object at the base, and let's just, for the sakes of, of doing it, now figure out what H is. Uh, L in this case is 0 0.3, 1 minus cosine of 30, so the height at which this thing had risen was 0 0.04 meters. And then the velocity would be, well, really, if we use just 
the H. And I've got the data still in my uh, calculator, so we can do this and get some accurate answers. 0 0.897 meters per second. So if we simply had, you had an object on an end of an arm at a particular uh, angle, you could determine what the velocity is at the bottom of the angle purely through using conservation of energy. Um, the next thing that we could do is when we go from three to two, it is conservation of momentum. What happened in that step from three to two or from two to three, we're dealing with an inelastic collision. The ball is captured by the arm. So the momentum at three is equal to the momentum at two. The momentum at three is mass of the arm plus mass of the ball times that velocity of the ball and the arm at the same time. And that is the 0.897. The momentum before, the momentum at two, is the mass of the ball times the velocity of that ball. And this is the answer that we're looking for. The whole purpose of the lab, the Conservation of Energy and Momentum Lab, is for you to eventually discover the velocity of the ball that shoots out of that, uh, out of the machine. <coughs> So let's figure this out. The velocity of the ball is the mass of the arm. I should have written it in lowercase, but deal with it. Uh, mass of the ball, the velocity of the ball arm, and then the mass of the ball. So this becomes zero point two plus zero point zero five divided by zero point zero five all multiplied by zero point eight nine seven So I get 4.49 meters per second. And that would be the velocity of the ball. And so that is, that is the, um, that's how you would do the lab experiment, is you basically work backwards. Now one of the things that I, that I definitely know is there are people in the room who are in my lab for conservation, momentum, and energy. Um, you show up and you don't know what to do and I go, well, did you go to, did you go to class? If you went to class, you will know how to do that lab. You'll be able to derive everything. Um, all right. So that is, those are a few of the conservation of, um, momenta conservation of energy. A um, couple of things that um, 
Yes. VBA is the velocity of the ball and the arm after collision. And so we do that. All right. Now, what we've seen is conservation of linear momentum. And what I want to do now is I want to work on an example of conservation of angular momentum. So in um, linear conservation of momentum, or you could just say conservation of momentum, the momentum initial is the same as the momentum final. In conservation of angular momentum, it's Li is equal to Lf. And one of the best examples that, um, that everybody has seen and we all know very well are the uh, ice skaters who they have their arms outward and they, they're spinning and then they pull their arms inward and what happens? The angular velocity of the person increases. They spin around more quickly. Now what I'm gonna teach you right now is something that you could do and take home and amuse yourself at the expense of someone else. So, ah, no, this is one of the benefit, one of the perks of being in Eschenberg's class. Initially, what you do is you go to a playground and if you look up, um, look up angular momentum playground and you'll see something like this. You get four people on a um, on one of those merry-go-rounds. Uh, there was one outside my brother's house in the park. It was about three, four meters across. And what happens is that you get the little kids and they're happy and you spin them around and they're, they're all cheerful and stuff. But what you really need to do is get three or four teenagers or adults on this thing. And let's say you spin it up so that the radial acceleration is 0 0.6. Hold on. Um, let me speed it up just a bit. Uh, let's say 2 meters per second per second. That the ex radial acceleration on this disc is 2 meters per second per second. If we all felt an acceleration to the side of 2 meters per second per second, we could kind of feel it. It would be a lot like uh, getting your car and turning around a curve. That centrifugal force, that fictitious force that you feel, which is really your body wanting to continue on, is pressed up against the wall. It's something that you can compensate for and, and deal with. Now let's say that the radius of this thing is uh, two meters. So if the radial acceleration is two meters per second per second, and the radius is two meters, well, let's figure something else first. What is the frequency, period, and angular velocity of this object before we even continue? So you have a circular moving object, a radial acceleration of two meters per second per second, uh, radius of two meters, What's the frequency? Well, we got to kind of dump out our usual suspects. 2 pi f is equal to omega. 1 over f is equal to t. Uh, radial acceleration is equal to v squared over r. And uh, v is equal to omega r.
And while I'm at it, let's just add linear velocity at a point. So I need to know this. I need to know I, I'm given that. And I want to know what uh, frequency period and angular velocity is. Well, the first thing is this equation right here. The AR is V squared over R. So AR times R is equal to V squared, or V is the square root of AR times R. So two times R, which is two. Oh, I like these numbers. So my linear velocity is two meters per second. So another example of me letting the numbers work out really well. Now that I have linear velocity, I know that V is omega R. So omega is V over R. So V is two, R is two. So omega is one radian per second. And as a side note, just as a little question to see if you're paying attention, omega is constant. What's alpha? I'm hearing a lot of mumbling. Huh? It's zero. What's alpha, the change in omega with respect to time? If omega never changes, then alpha must be zero. D omega dt is zero. Now that I have velocity and I've got omega, I know that two pi f is equal to omega. So f is omega over two pi or one over two pi and one over two pi is a frequency of 0 0.16 hertz. So the frequency of this thing is 0.16 hertz, which means that the period is 6.3 seconds. So this thing turns one time every 6.3 seconds, which is kind of a leisurely turn. Now this is where it gets interesting. I need to know if the mass of these each of these four kids is 20 kilograms and the mass of the disc is um, let's just say a hundred kilograms what's the moment of inertia of this disc so the total moment of inertia is the moment of inertia of the disc plus four times the moment of inertia of a single child each of the children are at the edge of the disc. The disc, its uh, moment of inertia is one half mass of the disc r squared. For the moment of inertia of a child, let's just assume that a child is a point particle, mass of the child r squared. So this becomes, uh, we could do, we could sort it out later. One half, 100, two squared plus four, 20, two squared. Uh, so this is 280 times, 80 times four, 320? Oh my goodness, this could end up being... What? Did I do the math wrong? I think I did. It should be 200 over here. 
Yeah, off by zero and things things go nuts. So it's 520 kilograms meters squared. So that's the moment of inertia of the disc with four kids at the edge. Now, if we wanted to calculate the angular momentum, which is what we've done before in other homework, L is equal to I omega. I is 520. We just solved for that. Omega is 1. So this is 520 kilograms meters squared per second. So the angular momentum that we have initially, 520, it should always be 520. Now this is the part that where it gets fun. Three of the kids step inward. So looking down at that's the center, those are the three kids. Each of those links are 0 0.5 meters. And that poor kid out there at the edge is still at two. So what three of the four have to be in on is the joke. They're gonna go from two meters out at the edge to only half a meter from the middle. So you're gonna have three of them. Now the new question is, what is the new moment of inertia? of this thing. The new moment of inertia is the moment of inertia of the disk plus three times the mass of a child times its new radius squared plus mass of the child times radius squared. In this particular case, R prime is 0 0.5 and R is 2. These are the three kids who are conspiring against this kid. That's the uh, mass of one of the kids at his radius. And then you got the moment of inertia of the disc. The moment of inertia of the disc we had before. That's 200. 3 times 20 times 0 0.5 squared plus 20 times 2 squared. Moment of inertia was what we solved over here. On this particular page, on this particular page, we said that the moment of inertia of the disk is one half mass of the disk r squared. We already done that. Mass of the disc, 100. Radius, 2, 200. Yeah. So I just, I just took... Mass of the disc, like the 100. The mass of the disc I gave you, okay. yes. Because that is back here. So the moment of inertia total is 200 plus three times 20 times 0.5 squared plus 20 times four, 295 kilograms meters squared. So the initial moment of inertia is 520. The new moment of inertia is 295. Let's see what happens. Conservation of angular momentum states that the old angular momentum must be the same as the new angular momentum. L is equal to I omega. So I omega is equal to I prime omega prime. Now, omega is one, so we can rewrite this 
as omega prime equals I omega over omega prime. I is 520, omega is 1, I prime 295. So our new angular velocity is 1.76 radians per second. So initially, our angular velocity was one radian per second. Now it's increased by 75% or 1.76 radians per second. Now things will move a little more quickly. What's the frequency? Well, the frequency is omega prime over 2 pi because omega is 2 pi f. Omega prime, 1.76, 2 pi. Or 0 0.28 hertz. So initially, that frequency was around 0.16. Now it's up to 0.28. The period, which is 1 over frequency, is 1 over 0 0.28 or 1.76 seconds. So the initial, the initial period was 6.3 seconds. Now it's 1.6. So the period has actually, you look confused. Is there a number error? Okay. Um, we've knocked off like four seconds off the period. Oh, is it? Did I do the math wrong? Okay. Three point five seven. Okay. So instead of instead of going at six point three, now it's down to three point five seven. And even I was looking at that number going, oh, I'm not so sure. So now it's down to three point five seven seconds. Let's figure out the linear velocity. Linear velocity is omega r. Omega is one point seven six. R is two. or 3.52 meters per second. And let's calculate AR. 3.52 squared over two, or R. Six point two meters per second per second. Now what we had initially was we had a radial acceleration of two. R prime, what I was looking for, oh, let me be more specific. What I'm looking for is the AR of, or the new AR of the child who was at the edge. So initially that child was experiencing a radial acceleration of only two meters per second per second. If you experienced a radial acceleration of two meters per second per second, you could probably hang on. Now this thing has gone from 20% gravity to over 60% gravity. It is tripled. For someone who is unaware, if gravity was to go from the side at two meters per second per second to six, 
everybody would just go, whoa, over to the other side of the room. Now, what typically happens is that the kid who's unaware gets flung off into the dirt. Um, and, then, uh, and then much hilarity ensues. So it, it, it can be done. It, a, lot of this, a lot of this depends on the mass. If the mass of the disc was a lot lighter, or think about this. If the people, if the three people at the edge of the disc move directly into the middle, you would lower the moment of, moment of inertia even further and increase the radi or angular velocity of the disc even more. Uh, this has been done in a few demos on YouTube. Uh, and then I discovered on a side note, what other, if you want real fun, you get a motorcycle, you turn it on its side, you put the tire up to the, um, up to the edge of the, the merry-go-round and you gun the engine and that causes the merry-go-round to spin even faster beyond its designed limits and uh, and then you get flung off even harder. Yes? They all have to do it simultaneously. And remember, as they're moving forward, the radial acceleration is increasing. So as you get closer, it's kind of getting harder to move towards the middle. So it actually requires a lot of work to get to that middle point. Then it wouldn't go as fast as it would if all three went in. It would be somewhere in the middle. Uh, you could do it with just like two, um, two people. And, and that could be easily done. All right, um, what we're gonna do for tomorrow is we're gonna review the problem set uh, that's out there. It's on Black, I think it's on Blackboard. If not, I'll double check. If you want a hard copy, it's outside my office. And um, have a safe weekend.